Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he buffed up a Vorinclex so he could call it Vorinflex, it's Matt Morgan. So I recently learned that in order to start a zoo, you have to have at least two pandas, a grizzly bear, and a polar bear. I hear that's the bear minimum. <laughs> <laughs> I I enjoy that, Matt. Although it sounds like if you had a zoo, all you'd be doing is monkeying around. Mm, I, You're not I, lying. I, <laughs> I I think that's the uh, the goat of the jokes there. So let's just move on. I appreciate it I, definitely. <laughs> I don't like that one, but we'll pretend that it happened better. Oh, you don't like it because it just got away <laughs> from you. <laughs> it did. All right. Up next, he's building a toppling tower out of Praetor cards, and he wants to call it his Jenga Taxius. It's Dana Roach. I, given the upcoming set, I figured I should finally get around to watching Doctor Who. Hmm. It was about time. <laughs> It's indeed, what I hear. It, yeah, indeed it is. Uh, just don't be tardy to the TARDIS or something like that. I also don't know Doctor Who very well, so... Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. <laughs> That's my question back, is when people talk about Doctor Who, is Doctor Who? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Matt, it's Doctor Whomst, anyway. Uh, Matt, what are we talking about in this week's episode? The latest SALT score updates, because... We did recently reopen the SALT score polls, and so we're going to talk about some uh, some trends that we're seeing, some changes in the data from last time we looked at this. Yeah, our annual SALT check-in, looking at any new cards that have risen up in the ranks, any changes that went around in there. This is one of the community favorite episodes, so we're excited to get back into it, but we've got some shout-outs to do before we get there. First, I'd like to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for helping editing the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. Heads up, I've also just found out I'll be able to go to the Command Fest in Portland, Oregon next weekend. That is the weekend of October 13th through the 15th. It's run by Laughing Dragon, so you'll see their event link with more information in the show notes of this episode. There are some cool artists and other guests there, like our friend Olivia Gobert-Hicks. It'll be rad to meet all of y'all who come by. Once again, that's the Command Fest in Oregon on the 13th through the 15th. I hope to see you there. And if you would like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing on YouTube. You can subscribe to your local podcast app, or you can go to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where we have patron tiers of all sorts of levels, whether you want to join our Discord community, see episodes a day early, where we steal segues all the time, hey. or you want to get that weekly patron shout out, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, which is what this week's patron did, patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. So thank you so much to Emma Emmett. Uh, that's There's a lot of alliteration here, but either way, Emma, we appreciate the support. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's absolutely terrific when folks uh, choose to support us in this way, choose to support us in any way. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a really fantastic group of folks. So we're happy to be able to shout you out. Thank you again. This is really, really terrific to see that y'all like the, the work that we do. We like that you like the work that we do. Thanks again, Emma. Uh, and now, guys, I guess we're going to get right into our show here. We've got the SALT Update 2023 edition. We've got a new top 10 of the SALT cards, and we'll run it through really quick, I think, before we start getting into some of the biggest risers and biggest changes in the SALT score data. Again, this is a community polling that we do. The SALT scores are ways for folks to say, mm, these are cards I don't really like seeing in games, and they're ranked on a scale of zero to four, just to be like, ah, here are some cards that I do or do not enjoy seeing. These can be cards that maybe you want to alert your playgroup to, like, hey, these certain cards are in my deck, and I know that can that can sometimes cause a, a play experience that people don't always like, so it's good to check in with folks. This is just a fun way to vote on a whole bunch of cards and see what we think. And we've got a new top 10 with a lot of familiar faces. So uh, Dana, how about you run us through it? What are we seeing in this top 10? Uh, number one and number two are no surprise cards from way back in the uh, from from originating in Alpha, and they've been causing salt since then. Winter Orb and Stasis, probably the least surprising entries on this list, and cards that I doubt will ever leave their positions yeah. in this top ten list. Um, you know, it's they've been talked about uh, ad nauseum. I think everyone knows why folks don't enjoy playing against Stasis and Winter Orb. So th they're at the top for a reason. Well, I I don't think ad nauseum is on the list, but it is <laughs> a yeah, fair, fair. pretty salty card for some circles. I get it. But coming in at number three, we do have Thassa's Oracle. Uh, it's been around for a little bit. It's one of those alternate win conditions that people just 
They don't seem to love if they're not in those <laughs> CEDH circles. So it's not a surprise to see this on the list or really to see it jump up to number three this year. Yeah, it was at spot number seven and it has moved up. Good for it, I suppose, or maybe bad for it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, continuing on there, number four is Static Orb, doing a lot of the same things that we saw the first two cards on this list doing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the classic at number five is Armageddon, destroying all your lands. And so far, we've had salt scores of 2.6 and above. Yet these are classics of the genre. The, the, the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? A lot of these are cards <laughs> we're already familiar with and that we totally expected to see here once again. Yeah, and the next three here in, in the 2.5 range also cards that we're not really surprised to see here. Uh, the original Vorn Clex, which keeps you from untapping lands, doing a similar thing to Winter Orb Stasis and Static Orb. Um, Turgrid, that's, you know, kind of the the discard bugaboo that everyone uh, really doesn't like going against <laughs> for, for hand destruction reasons. Get right out of here with it. <laughs> yeah. And then Expropriate, take all the extra turns for the most part. There wasn't a lot of movement among those three. Turgrid, though, is the one that did leap up. And, and this was a pretty big move from 18 to number seven. It was not in the top 10, mm. um, just in the top 20 last year. And it made a pretty huge move up to number seven. I mean, I'm just glad people are finally listening to me when I've been saying <laughs> since the card was first previewed, this is a dumb card. And <laughs> finally, the community has decided to listen to me. I've been saying this for years now. But yes, so seeing Turgrid jump up to number seven overall in the top salt list that's super fitting. It's it's where exactly where I thought it would be is somewhere close to the top five of the salt score. I was just going to say, Matt, we got millions upon millions of votes for the salt scores. We did. Were hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of them, just you trying to vote for Turgrid as many times as possible to result in this score? I think I had a career low voting. <laughs> I think I only got like 500 votes in this year, which is mm. <laughs> very low for me. But I, I know some people were very proud of getting thousands and thousands of, of votes in. So good on you if you're those people, because you carried the weight that I should have been carrying this year. <laughs> yeah, the salt voting is a whole lot of fun. Uh, rounding in at number nine here, we've got Obliterate, another land destruction effect. So no surprise to see it here. But Dockside Extortionist moved up from spot number 14 on the salt list to spot number 10 with a salt score of 2.49. Uh, overall, like in terms of like the jostling of things within the top 20, there actually is a lot of the same cast of characters as there were last year. But Dockside Extortionist breaking into the top 10, good for it, but also bad for it. People love that treasure and they also hate how much treasure it makes. It's interesting because I've voted for plenty of cards for the salt score. And the, the struggle I kind of have in terms of my votes here are... I don't like Winter's Orb. I don't like Stasis. Like, I understand why they're salt inducing, and I would have given them a salt, salty score. Simultaneously, I, I don't see Winter Orb and Stasis outside of decks where, like, th those don't accidentally show up. Mm. People are intentionally building decks around those effects. And generally, if you're building a Winter Orb or a Stasis deck, you know what that deck is trying to do, and it tends to not show up in places it shouldn't show up. So while I gave them salty scores, if, if I if, if I saw them, and I did see Stasis, I think it was the second card I saw when I when I did my, my salt rankings. Awesome. I also like understand there's a bit of a disconnect. Now, the reason I mention this is because something like Dockside doesn't have that problem. Dockside just gets hard jammed into a gazillion decks, whether the power is appropriate or not. So like Dockside is one of those cards I absolutely understand why it moved up in the ratings. And I think you see Turgrid a little bit doing that. And I definitely think you see Thassa's Oracle doing that. I think all three cards that had moves here into the top 10, or at least moved higher in the top 10, are cards that I think show up for whatever reason outside of places where you might expect them or where they might be appropriate. Well, in Dockside Extortionist, I just, I can't help but feel the target on its back gets bigger and bigger the more and more people pay attention to it, where it's, it got a reprint semi-recently. It wouldn't surprise me if the salt is just because there's more available, pe more people are getting to experience playing against it or the, the displeasure of playing against it, I guess I should say. <laughs> and so that's why Dockside is finally creeping up to where, yeah, seeing Dockside finally crack into the top 10 of the salt list, kind of been a long time coming almost. If it was a $5 card, it'd be putting up like stasis numbers, I think. Oh, yeah. Because it would just see so much play. If it were only $5, it would have been so ubiquitous and so yeah. many people have been up in arms. And I, I know people are kind of torn on if yes. the card deserves the ban hammer or not. And I, I struggle to mm. be convinced one way or another, which to me says, let's just go with the status quo. But yeah, the price definitely keeps it from affecting more games than it has. 
There's definitely something to be said for the idea that certain cards get salt scores because of just their sheer popularity. Uh, like, you know, stasis is certainly a source of frustration, but it also only shows up in not even 9,000 decks, whereas Doxat yeah. Extortionist shows up in 262,000 decks in the EDH rec database. And some other cards like Cyclonic Rift or Fierce Guardianship also fall into that, like, so powerful it's hard not to justify them in just about any deck, which I think also probably is a source of it just sort of design-wise is rubbing people the wrong way, maybe not even just the effect that it has in gameplay, which is also pretty pretty huge too, but also just like the way that it affects your deck building could also be a source of some of that ire, I think. And, and its popularity certainly informs that. There are cards that are nowhere in the salt list that I find very, very salt-inducing, like, I don't know, Naked Singularity or whatever, which changes everyone's mana production and is a nightmare to keep up with. Sure. But you never see it. So, of course, people aren't going to vote high for it because that's just not the kind of thing that would come to mind necessarily compared to the stuff that we very obviously see Dockside doing a lot of the time. So, again, good for it, but also bad for it. Well, and I, I guess my, my last observation on the top 10 is a majority of these cards once again deal with something that somebody's messing with your resources and it turns out players don't like it when you mess with their resources so mm. you have winter orb and stasis that prevent you from untapping Vorn collects the same thing or just armageddon and obliterate that just destroy all your resources so once again that's just the theme of the top 10 it's a majority of the cards are don't mess with my stuff man <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say even more specifically than mess with your resources, they mess with your time as a person. Yeah, yeah. Almost all of these cards, with the exception being Dockside Extortionist, almost all of these cards impact how much magic you get to play and like what your time is spent doing. Mm -hmm. They make you spend a lot of time not playing magic, um, which is the exact opposite of the thing you sat down to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. that's. I, I think that the key component and really then Dockside does that to a degree too, by like giving your opponents so many more resources than you, they just get to play more magic than you. So in, in a way it's kind of doing the same thing. Sure. Well, in Turgrid, they get to play more magic than you with your own stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matt's got a vendetta. <laughs> I do. I'm not going to deny it. And I do think some of the stuff, like I, I, I don't think those are necessarily bad things. If you are if you are, someone looking to do that. I understand the fun of trying to fight through a puzzle or some, a, a complicated situation if you are looking to do that. But the reality is I think most folks aren't looking to do that. Like that's, that, that's not an enjoyable experience for, for most people. And when you run into these things in a situation where you weren't prepared for that, I absolutely understand why that's frustrating and why these cards then generate these high salt ratings. That part is very key. The, the a, a card that you were prepared for versus a card that's a surprise, that is a very mm -hmm. different salt type of experience, and that's very key to keep in mind for all of these figures. Yeah, absolutely. Just a card, a, a puzzle that you sat down to solve versus a puzzle that you were forced to solve. Two very, very different things. And again, like Dana said, if that's the type of gameplay you like, where you like to, okay, well, here's this difficult board state, try to solve it. That's awesome. There, there's space for you in the game, but yeah. the stats are kind of showing that a majority of players, that's not the experience they're looking for. And so it it is kind of telling that the majority is starting to kind of speak out and say, well, we this actually isn't what we're looking to do. Now, we mentioned Dockside a lot there, but even though it broke into the top 10, it is not actually the biggest riser amongst all of the salt data that we've got. When we compared some scores from last year to this year, we saw some really interesting figures that I'm I'm excited to sink my teeth into these because uh, some of them were pretty surprising. The number one card that saw the highest salt score increase compared to last year is, drumroll please, Shieldred the Apocalypse, the mono black black shieldred that makes your opponents lose life whenever they draw a lot of cards last year it had a score of 1.1 it's gone up a full point it's now at 2.13 that's pretty darn big and it's not the only legend that had a big increase the number two card that saw the biggest increase is joda the unifier which went from 0.75 and doubled up to now 1.41 uh, that's pretty intense, I gotta say. Um, some of these legends are uh, starting to appear a little bit more in people's games, I think, and folks are not always super adoring those experiences. Shieldred especially, du doubling its its salt score, not surprising at all. I, I've played against it once, and I had a copy that I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll put it into my, I have a, a Legendary Matters deck, and I'll, I'll maybe put it in that. I played against it once and immediately knew this is not the type of gameplay I'm looking for and decided not to put it even in the deck. I, I sold it to a vendor at an event 
And that was that. It. Mm. I am 0% shocked to see Shieldra double its salt score. That's absolutely lines up with what I've experienced too. One of the points I, I didn't make about Daxite Extortionist being the top 10 there is I think the card is also salt inducing because it feels like the power level attached to it is, I don't know if undeserved is the right word, but I feel like for two mana, the amount of power that your, your opponent gets, it feels unfair. Hmm. And I think that's what, I think a lot of the cards we're looking at now down to this point are cards where when your opponent plays them, it feels like the power level attached to those cards is not commiserate, is, is not commiserate with the amount of work required to get that power level. I think both J Jodas we've gotten the last couple of years feel that way. I think Shieldred feels that way. It's like it's a card that your opponent's playing. It feels like they've gotten a whole ton of value out of that card for just putting it in play for a couple mana. Joda the Unifier's design is definitely astonishing to me. Yeah. Like it, it is an enormous buff and it also has a mega cascade effect. I've said it before, but it's combining two different effects of legendary slivers into a single card and it's bonkers powerful. Like what were they thinking with that card? He even buffs himself. Like why? What, what is that card? So I, I, th I think that is definitely something that is a factor for a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, I guess the response could be that, well, you too can play powerful cards. Um, but I think that that the, the problem with that argument is then you're limiting, like if you want to go against a, uh, basically any Jota deck, <laughs> the, the reality <laughs> is, um, and, and match that power, there's a limited amount of commanders that let you do that. Um, so I, I think part of the frustration with a lot of these kind of uh, commanders in particular is it feels like it limits the things that you can play into it. And that's, I, I understand why that's also like salt inducing and why that's frustrating when you feel like your opponent's playing a thing that is, that, that feels very powerful without requiring them to do much work. And it feels like you have to in turn play something similar to keep up or you're just going to lose every game. And yeah, that's, that's salt inducing. I mean, th three of the top four cards that we see as the top risers, they all kind of do that. They, they kind of raise the bar and you have to meet that bar if you want to keep up. Number three, being world fire, which was unbanned, finally started showing up in decks. People latched on and oh, maybe this isn't as fun as we thought. But number four is the Beamtown Bullies, which it's always that Beamtown Bullies deck, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's always yeah. Willbender. It's always Beamtown Bullies. Well, yeah, world fire saw an increase of 0.57 now up to 2.0 on the salt score. And that's the one that resets everything, uh, puts everyone's life total at one. Uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like, uh, all right, sure. Um, I think that that does generally probably self-select out of most playgroups, and that was the justification for unbanning it. But Beamtown Bullies, that one is not a thing that I can say self-selects very well. Uh, that one also saw an increase of 0.51, so it doubled up to a score of 1.16. And yeah, every time I've seen this deck, uh, I've seen it distribute things like a leveler to other players that just auto-delete them from the game. And I... I have often seen people walk away from a Beamtown Bullies game feeling like they just didn't get to do the thing that they were really hoping to do all week, you know? I couldn't get to do anything, a lot of cases, <laughs> right? <laughs> like it, it, your time has been taken by a by, by a card that's both very powerful and takes your time. Well, it's not even that it does those two things, but it does it so reliably because you have green to make yeah. a bunch of mana, you have black to cheaply put things into your graveyard with a lot of redundancy on both ends. So really all I have to do is just ramp out into Beamtown Bullies untap and you end somebody's game pretty quickly and that i think that's why beamtown bullies is so i mean you're seeing the numbers jump up as much as you are because it not only does the thing but it does it very reliably and that's the frustrating part is there's never a game where beamtown bullies just kind of oh i just i never really got started it's so easy in these colors to do what you set out to do and we've been talking about commanders quite a bit here, but like the next card in the list is Farewell, yeah. hmm. which took another big increase here. And again, it's the same thing. It's a card that just feels ridiculously powerful in every situation in a way that doesn't really require you to do anything to get the power out of it. You just look at it and you're like, I am just going to pick that and that and that that in ways that minimally affect me and devastate everybody else. Um it, it, it's a card that just feels like it does way too much in a really like 
difficult to walk back from way since it's also an exile effect for the issue that i think i have with farewell and the times that i've seen it and i've had a little bit of a ho-hum kind of reaction to it which isn't terribly often uh, technically but the times that i've seen it i'm more like oh well the game's gonna last another 30 minutes now <laughs> it's like honestly my reaction to it sure so like the card effect is one thing i i'm not sure that i'm just like oh they should never have printed this or that it i, I don't think i have a, an outsized emotional reaction to the design of the card so much as just when i see it i know that i'm in for a much longer game and i was like oh, you know i actually i wouldn't have minded if we had just played an hour and 10 minute game instead of what is now probably going to last much much longer yeah um, so i think that tends to be my issue with that particular one but that's just me well and there's a difference between a board wipe and a just full-on reset that's that's the difference where you know a board wipe you blow up all the creatures clear the board out but there's still artifacts enchantments and all that stuff and also they're destroyed they're going to the graveyard farewell gets rid of everything for good. It exiles everything, but also it's getting rid of all effectively all the non-land permanents pretty reliably. So that's just, it's such a hard reset. You're not just hitting the reset button on the game console. You're taking the disc out and hucking it down the street because that's how <laughs> long it's going to take for the game to get going again. That's funny. I, I will actually note here, farewell is an interesting thing uh, to note. And actually one other thing that is interesting here to note too, is the card Tox Reel, which also saw an increase, not quite to the same extent, but it saw an increase of almost 0.4. Um, and those are two cards that we were actually keeping our eyes on from our last salt video update last year, because then we saw some new cards from that year that had some initial high scores. And we were like, hmm, it'll be interesting to see where these settle. Uh, the new Jenga Taxius, for example, mm -hmm. Meat Hook Massacre, Hinata. Those were some early, ooh, these are big salt scores for brand new cards. What will happen to them? And most of those cards stayed precisely where they were. They've kind of just maintained their current salt score, except for Farewell, which saw the increase as number five biggest riser, Toxreel, which also saw a pretty sizable increase uh, within the top 15 biggest risers. And Miram Sentinel Worm also saw an increase of 0 0.3, 0 0.35, I want to say. Um, so those three actually did rise just a little bit as people got to play with them more. And so those are some new cards that it's like, oh, all right, we were right to keep our eyes on these. That is an interesting thing to note. Drainith Magistrate is one we should probably talk about here too, just briefly. It had a pretty decent leap here. And it's also a card that people talk about a lot as being a problem. Mm. And, and, and I think this is very much one of those dockside extortionist parallels where I, I think folks tend to run it in a lot of decks where maybe it isn't necessarily appropriate or at least where people aren't prepared to be playing that kind of game. And, and, and I don't know. I don't know why that happens with some cards. I think that was the biggest problem with Paradox Engine. Hmm. People jammed it in a lot of places where it wasn't necessarily appropriate. I think if that had seen way less play in casual games, it never would have got banned. But for whatever reason, there was uh, people had heard this siren song about Paradox Engine and they put it in a whole ton of places. I think that happens with Dockside. And I think that's starting to happen with Dranith Magistrate as well. Yeah, it jumped up from spot number 30 to spot number 15, uh, going from 2.03 to a score of 2.4. So that one is certainly creeping up here. I, I almost wonder if its card types affect things here. It's a human and a wizard. And so it, it's easy to justify putting into, for example, human decks. It's certainly well known in competitive EDH spaces, but I wonder if some of those extra synergies for its creature types might actually kind of like inform a little bit of the reason why you might see it outside of those spaces. And that kind of just like opened that door to make it feel more normal in those spaces too. It's just a theory. I'm not entirely sure. My biggest beef with a card is I think it's a card that's really easy to play poorly. <laughs> well, I, I, and I, I mean, I, I, I get the logic why it's maybe a necessary card to play in some situations, you know, we talked about really powerful commanders and the, they need to turn them off. But like it's I've experienced plenty of situations where someone plays it thinking they are dealing with that person over there and just wind up shutting everybody else off and like giving sure. that person an advantage in some way, shape or form. So I, I think it's, it's it's very easy to have collateral damage with that card. Mm. And that's always been the thing that annoyed me about it way more than the actual power level was it's just so easy to inadvertently cause a lot of problems at the table. Collateral damage is a perfect word for that. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's just, a, there's a lot of these cards that very much are like every, everyone got together to go fishing and, and they're the one buddy who showed up with dynamite. Like, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I understand why that's a, that's an effective method to get fish from the lake, but that's not the same thing the rest of us were doing. And <laughs> it's maybe not that much fun to, uh, 
get in a boat with you (laughs) (laughs) to continue the metaphor. Well, so I guess to kind of continue along the metaphor of explosions, um, another card that I think can be very explosive also saw a bit of a rise. And this one surprises me. This is also a card that is within the the top 15, actually within the top 10 biggest risers. And that's Acroma's Will saw an increase of uh, 0.41. It's now up to assault score of 1.03, which 1.03, all things considered, is quite low on the assault score. Again, this is a range of zero to four. So it's not like this is a, oh no, the sky is falling with this card or whatever, but Acroma's will is, you know, getting, all right, that's that's a decent rise there. And I think that's worth taking note of. I almost wonder if this card, which can give so many protective keywords and combat of keywords to your stuff, if it's kind of entering into almost a crater hoof behemoth type of territory where it is a very reliable and very powerful win condition that maybe folks are like, oh, I've kind of seen this a whole lot. So they're a little sick of seeing it and therefore that's earning it a bigger score as time moves on. Mm-hmm. Moonshaker Cavalry, just for comparison, which is the even newer white crater hoof effect, has a salt score of 0.71, while crater hoof behemoth has a salt score of 1.8. So I know I'll be keeping my eye on these new ones to see whether people playing them more in the future moves that needle at all. Uh, like you mentioned before, actual exposure to these cards has a lot to do with the scores they get and whether those scores change. Yes, Acroma's Will is very good if you have a board state and you just get to cast it. Sometimes all you need is that one shot just for one combat step, really, which is why, like you said, Joey, Crater Roof is a very good analogy or, or direct line of where you see this card trending because you cast Chroma's Will, more often than not, one person is dead. And one person is dead, and it's also has a really good chance of gaining you enough life to make sure nobody else is going to take you out for a couple turns. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, you, it's really difficult to leave yourself open um, with a Chrome as well, um, it, it's, it's kind of one of those, it's much more <laughs> difficult to screw up than some other things. Your creature stayed behind his blockers because of vigilance. You just gain a ton of life. It, it, it lets you kill a person or multiple people. And if you don't finish everyone off, you're in a really difficult position to remove then the following turn. So yeah, I, I, again, I understand why that card's a little bit frustrating to play against as well. Well, it turns out, I mean, a card that the both of you love, True Conviction, Turns out getting like a, a cheaper version of that, hmm. even for one combat step, is super, super powerful. Uh, speaking of powerful, challenge stats segue. What the? <laughs> what? We weren't even. What? <laughs> what the heck, Matt? <laughs> we it, we it, had it, more it, cards to talk about. It just seemed fit- We've got a second half to talk about cards. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that one. That was the most ham-fisted I, I, buddy. I mean, I used a Chroma's Will to force my way into a Segway right here. Oh, my word. All right. Yeah, <laughs> folks, we'll be back. You know, I, I'm excited for us to get to the, the cards that have seen any decreases in the salt score, but we are going to have to leave you in suspense for that. We've got some data to challenge first, so we'll be right back after a quick break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Here's a question for you. Do you ever feel like your own brain is getting in your way? Like you know you want to fall asleep, for example, but your thoughts just won't stop racing? Or if you know you want to go visit with folks, but for some reason you just feel a little disconnected from the ability to actually go do it? Therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back. I know I don't know how my own mind works, but I do know that talking about it with other people and investigating those experiences has always helped me realign those thoughts so that it feels more like my mind is working for myself rather than working against myself. With BetterHelp, you can discuss it with a licensed therapist. It's all online, it's designed to suit your schedule, it's flexible, and you can switch therapists for no additional charge, which is a great way to make sure that you find a therapist that's right for you and your needs. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash EDH today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash EDH. The card I want to challenge for Challenge the Stats this week, um, Monumental Corruption. Three black black for sorcery. It says target player draws X cards and loses X life, where X is the number of artifacts you control. I'm not necessarily challenging this for a specific commander, although there's a lot of black commanders that care about artifacts and tend to have a lot of artifacts in play. Inquisitor Einhorn, um, Imatek the Stormlord, uh, Burakos Party Leader makes a ton of treasures, Forged Everyone Charlatan makes treasures. Um, but 
talking about the, the new Doctor Who cards coming out, we're getting a bunch more artifact tokens in Weeping Angels and Dalek tokens as well, on top of the crazy amount of food and treasure and clues that we're already seeing pop up in the game. If you're playing one of these black decks, you can get a ton of value for five mana, you know, very easily drawing 10, 12 cards so that you have the life to pay. But what's really nice about this card is it's target player and you can very easily find yourself in a situation in one of those decks as well where, hey, maybe I don't want to, you know, lose 12 life to draw 12 cards, but that person at 11 life can absolutely draw 12 cards and lose 12 life. Hmm. It's one of those spells that works very nicely either way. Early on, you can draw a good amount of cards for a really good price. And in a lot of these decks, later on, you can absolutely dome somebody. It's in just under 5,000 decks in EDH Rec right now, and it should see more play. And I think with the advent of these new token artifact types that are coming into the game, we should see even more play. Nice. Well, my challenge this week is also related to artifact stuff, so I'll jump into mine. And this is actually a card that I think is overplayed for a specific commander. Uh, the card Tempered Steel is an enchantment that shows up in a whole lot, 47% of Urza Chief Artificer decks. And I just want to push back a little bit against that one. Tempered Steel is the enchantment. This is artifact creatures you control get plus two, plus two. And I don't think that this commander needs that because this is the Urza who pumps out every single turn one of those zero zero constructs that gets plus one plus one for every artifact that you control. So this enchantment is giving those artifacts that are already very big and don't need a whole ton of help to get very big. It's helping them get a little bit bigger, which is the same thing that you would be able to accomplish if you just made a couple of thopters or if you made a couple of treasures. I get that it's an enchantment, it can stick around for a little bit longer, but in terms of buffing up your stuff, you've already got Chief of the Foundry, you've got Urza, Prince of Krug that shows up in a lot of these decks too, that also gives your artifact stuff a buff, but it also has even further utility beyond that to help you create even more tokens of things. If you want to pump up your artifact creatures in this deck that already makes huge artifact creatures, uh, populate a couple of those Urza tokens and you will be solid. I think you'll deal even more damage that way. Tempered Steel is a very cool card, but I think this particular artifact deck that already makes such big beaters in the first place doesn't need an enchantment to help modify those artifacts any further. So for that reason, I'm going to call this one overplayed in those Urza decks. Yeah, it's a good catch, Joey. So I'll wrap us up then. So we had a listener, went to patreon.com slash edh joined at a certain tier where you can submit challenge stats picks, which we have a challenge all for in our Discord server. And Taikiatsu in our Discord, I don't know if these cards are good or great, but they <laughs> definitely pull my heartstrings. They, they remind me of when I was playing as a kid. And so seeing these pop up in a challenge of stats, I, I just want to shout it out. So Taikiatsu said, I would like to put forward a challenge uh, that would pique Joey's love of new cards like Ariad of the Charmed Apple, which has over 3,000 decks to her name already. It's the most built commander this past month. People are all about this commander. So shout out to Dana also with cards from the 90s. And it occurred that there's a much maligned and ignored cycle of Lissids that may find a place in Ariat decks that want to move enchantments from one creature to another that just became a higher level threat. So for those of you who don't know what the Lissids are, it is a cycle back from Stronghold and Tempest, which Dana, right up your alley. And these are, they come down as creatures that you can pay some mana and tap them and they become an aura that moves onto any given creature. Then you can pay mana to stop that from happening. And it becomes a creature once again. So all sorts of wild things you can be doing with it. And Taikiatsu said, even though there's only five Lissids from the Tempest block that can be used for the strategy, once they're online, they have a reputation for being difficult to get rid of. Assuming that they become an untapped aura enchantment, you don't even have to wait until the end of the turn to shift from one opposing creature to another and extend the power of the Lissid enchantments. I just like all of the Lissids. It's a nice way to, okay, well, if you attack someone else... I will give you this Lissid bonus and also I'll get it with Ariat's ability too. Leeching Lissid, way to just kind of leech health from the players. There's also different, all sorts of different ways. And again, I don't know if these are great necessarily, but I <laughs> love seeing Lissids. I just, I tried to make them work when I was a kid and never really did. I don't know if it'll work great, but I, I love the cycle anyway. So Taikiatsu, thank you so much for the submission. Definitely appreciate the support. And uh, I appreciate shouting out Lissids because here we are. I haven't thought about Lissids in 
so many years. I don't think anyone has, but I, I'll take it. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, sometimes the real challenge is just in our hearts of just like, hey, here's a nostalgia thing that I'm just like, it, it, here's really what it is. It's just like, you're, if you play one of these, your opponents will absolutely go like, wait, what is that? What does it do? And that alone is just the, the experience that you really want sometimes, right? So, oh man. Absolutely. This is wild. Okay, guys, well, let's get back to our topic here. And before the break, I teased about the opposite of what we just talked about. There are some cards that have had a bit of a fall off in the salt data that we want to get into. It, well, we also have some salty new cards from just this past year uh, that, that are going to be interesting to get into. I don't know where to start. I guess we'll start with the fall off. So I teased that one. I teased that one. So let's start with that. Matt, have there been any cards of note that have seen a slight decrease in their salt scores compared to last year? Well, there are. And... It's funny looking at this because the risers are significant. Like they, they jump up a lot, but when a card falls, it just seems kind of to creep down a little bit. I, th I would say probably the reputation for cards kind of lingers a little bit longer than it takes to get a reputation. So we're seeing cards like World Gorger Dragon, Palancron. They're dropping a little bit, but it's percentage points. It's not even 10% of a drop off at this point. It's going from 1.2 to 1.02, which is whatever i don't i don't think that's that there's anything to write home about certainly mm -hmm. so seeing kind of cards like this i don't know the, the the droppers they're not dropping all that much even though they they rightfully so probably they're not the boogeymen they used to be when we first started doing the salt scores but also i don't know it doesn't seem all that significant of a drop well, it, it, World Gorger Dragon and Palacron in particular are interesting because, number one, they're very, very old cards. Um, and if you're a new player, I don't think it's readily apparent what those cards do in terms of, like, how they get used in combo decks um, as, as a fast win. So uh, you could very easily chalk up the decrease in those cards to folks who've just never seen them and therefore, like, yeah, what's that? That's That card's not a problem. Um, so they just give it a low score. So like, I think it's entirely possible for some of these cards, those two in particular, you're seeing a decrease just because newer folks have no idea what they even really do and how they interact with the combo. I think potentially there's another explanation here, though, uh, to skip down to our number four and number five of the cards that have had the biggest fall off. Again, these are very gentle. <laughs> these aren't like huge fall offs. But Urza, Lord High Artificer, actually also went down by... 0.13 and Thrasios also went down by 0.13. I mean, Urza still has a salt score of 2.1, but I think that small uh, drop off for cards like World Gorger, Urza, Thrasios, those are pretty commonly known to be either combo commanders or just in the competitive scene in general, which is more the type of thing where you expect what these are going to do. So potentially that's another explanation. These are cards that aren't sure. considered to be salty because folks know going in what to expect from those types of cards or the combos that they're related to. Well, and two, yeah, you said it. They're, they're kind of they're all combo pieces. World Gorger Dragon. I don't think anybody plays it outside of the combo deck. I, I haven't seen it in the wild and forever. Palancron, kind of the same thing. It's just it's so expensive at this point. Being a reserveless mm. card, whatever you're doing a Palancron, you can do for Peregrine Drake for ten cents versus hundred dollars. And so Palancron dropping off, bribery, kind of same thing. Just I don't know. People are playing in paper more, so it's it's less difficult to play over spell table. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. That might be it there. Oh, well, yeah, you, you just mentioned that one there. That was the number three entry was Bribery, the five mana blue sorcery that goes and steals a card from one of your opponent's decks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a slight decrease of 0.16 here. Not terribly much. Maybe the in-person play is a result, but like, I don't know. It, it feels like, to be honest, I don't think Bribery is as good as it used to be. That, that's kind of my read on that card, which is a shame. I think it's a really cool card. Oof. But it. Oh, oh, do you disagree? You I don't know about. I I do disagree. Oh, I think okay. Bribery is only as as good as the cards in your opponent's decks. And we talk about power creep all the time. So Bribery is basically just whatever the best card is in your opponent's deck, which means it's always getting better. But also, I think the rest of the format's kind of catching up to what Bribery does. So basically, it's only as good as your opponents allow it to be. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it probably falls into one of those, like an area of salt we've seen before are the cards that like steal your stuff. Uh, for example, Xanathar, the Guild Kingpin, that did have a high salt score, I want to say in 2021. But in 2022, it fell off quite a bit because the, it being a little bit of a boogeyman of like, ha, I'm going to steal your stuff. People actually played it out and they were like, oh, it's it's not actually quite the experience that I necessarily thought. Sometimes it 
It isn't always that bad for people to steal cards off the top of my deck, for example, compared to the effects that steal cards directly from your hand, like send triplets or, or Turgrid, <laughs> for, for instance. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if like there's a bit of that element here now that there are other cards like Captain Nagathrod as well that are doing a little bit of thievery uh, here and there. Cards like Bribery that used to occupy a certain mental zone maybe no longer occupy that mental zone. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm just throwing out a couple of ideas. In, in my opinion, I haven't played Bribery in a whole long time, uh, so I wouldn't have given it a high salt score myself. So those are just my reasons but uh, people oh, have yeah, their I, own reasons i don't think it it's salt inducing anymore i still think it's powerful but also mm. yeah i'm gonna spend five mana to steal one of your things versus i'm gonna play a turgor and steal all of your things i think <laughs> the, the power is still there i think the attention is just getting shifted to the cards that are doing that thing only more egregiously mm, mm -hmm. well i mean speaking of doing things egregiously we probably can look at the the saltiest cards from the last year the, the newest <laughs> members of the the, the, the salt oh, list here why doesn't joey get mad at those segues because that also is pretty ham-fisted <laughs> uh that would that i actually kind of like that one not gonna lie like, oh <laughs> matt yours was Whoa. abrupt you, you, yours yours wasn't an instant it was the old card type interrupt whereas dana's was dana's had had an enchantment to it i like like that one a lot actually <laughs> um, uh, okay so yeah yeah you mentioned it there are the saltiest new cards in the past year and if folks didn't watch the whole video they are missing out because i think this is some really juicy information to, to get into matt um do you <laughs> do, do you like the entry as the number one newest card that has a high salt score or um <laughs> or do you not i don't know i feel like it maybe means a whole lot to you and so i'm curious to see your reaction <laughs> I, I mean if you're watching on youtube you've seen it in the background right over there but it, I mean, <laughs> it is i understand why because the one ring is kind of the marquee card from the lord of the rings tales of middle, middle earth set I understand why, because just there's so much inevitability. It's very hard to deal with. It gives you protection. There's there's a lot going on with this card. I, I totally understand why people would be a little salty to see it. Also, it's expensive. It is not a cheap card by any means. And so, yeah, it, I could understand in the same way people get salty from seeing a fetch land and, and ABU duels type of mana base. I understand that feeling. So seeing the one ring popping up at, at such a high number it's it's got a salt score of 2.2 2, uh, above average for sure uh, um yeah I, I i understand why do i like it no but i also <laughs> the number two card also happens to be from tales of middle earth and this one i i totally get and i agree with it being there orcish bowmasters is the number two saltiest new card coming in at 1.89 on the on the salt score so that one that one i guess so one thing i will say about both of these cards i i think the reality is perception impacts a lot of this stuff. We talked yeah, about sure, how sure. the both Winter Orb and Stasis are the top cards on this list and have been there forever, despite the fact that I would wager most players don't see them very often outside situations where you know what you're getting into. Not to say it doesn't happen, but like Stasis deck requires something very specific, and if you sit down, you're usually aware you're playing against a Stasis deck. Mm. Reputationally, those cards are very salt-inducing, though, so people vote them that way despite ha perhaps never seeing them. I, I feel like both of these cards are, are currently experiencing some levels of salt because of their reputation in other formats. Hmm. That's not to say they're both not excellent cards and very powerful cards and perhaps very salty cards in Commander, but the things they are doing to other formats that aren't Commander, I think perhaps is causing some trickle down into our format in terms of how people react to them. And I think as they perhaps get banned out of other formats or, or people get better at dealing with them in those formats or whatever, I think these some of that reputation might change how they're viewed here in Commander too. I, I would not be shocked if these were not in this location next year on this list, particularly the One Ring. Yeah, that that's very fair. The One Ring being at Salt Rank number 30. It's Rank 30. That's pretty big for a, a new entry. Uh, and uh, these are, again, sort of like what we were talking about earlier with some new cards that we kept our eyes on, the talk trails and all of them. Uh, these are ones that we'll be keeping our eyes on to see do they have any creep downwards? Does anything move or, or not? Um, I, I am also very curious, and I think the reputation is a very good read on it. But I mean, mm -hmm. rank number 30 is, is pretty, 2.2 is a high score for that one ring card. Um, and, and 
yeah, that's just an interesting thing to go over. I actually haven't seen either of these in play very much at all myself. Uh, the only Orcish Bowmasters I've seen in play is one that I have in my own Conrad deck, and it was uh, stolen from me by another uh, kind of salty <laughs> in, uh, new card, apparently, which was Atali Primal Conqueror, which has um, got a rank of 1.34 so far. So uh, what th I think that's the number five uh, highest new card on the salt uh, stuff here. Um, you know, not all that high in general, but uh, it, it steals your stuff. And on the backside, it's got some poison counters. So people, I think, had some immediate thoughts when they saw that one. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of skipping around the list there, though. There are a few others for us to get to. Yeah, I mean, the number three and number four new saltiest cards, Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, and then Attracts a Grand Unifier, a couple new legends. And I think just the reputation of both of these cards kind of gets them that place. I, Elish Norn, Mother of Machines. I've seen it once and it was powerful, but I don't know if it was doing anything excessively salt inducing, kind of like the original Elish Norn Grand Cinnabite has, where that's just, I mean, that makes just an impossible board state to kind of solve for some decks. And Atraxa Grand Unifier, it's just Atraxa. <laughs> the original version that we saw of Atraxa is still the number one most popular deck of all time. And so, yeah, it's just, you see a tracks that you immediately get these flashbacks, even if the, the most current version, it's very powerful, but I don't know if it's necessarily lining up with the salt score we're doing. I mean, speaking for myself here, um, of these top five new cards we're looking at, number four, number five, Atraxa and Atali are the ones that, for me personally, are the most salt inducing. Mm. I, I found them both to be kind of miserable to play against in terms of how much time of mine gets sucked up by the people playing those commanders. They both tend to play the same way where like they're blinks repeatedly. And when that is done, there's a lot of game actions that take place. Like there are two commanders that can very much lead to situations where number one, they're very difficult to interact with because an ETB ability. And number two, you just spend a whole ton of time on your phone waiting for the person to like <laughs> resolve these repeated blink turns as they're doing a whole bunch of game actions. Um, it, of these cards, uh, next year, if, if these have much higher ranks than the one ring in Arcus Bowmasters, I would not be remotely shocked. Interesting. One one that I actually, you know, talking about our own personal stake in this, the number six card is the one that actually I yes. I, I could imagine being a little bit higher. Speaking of blinking and, and putting stuff back into play, Dana, uh, Portal to Phyrexia is the sixth highest new card from the past year that has a salt score. The salt score is just 1.29. It's at like salt rank number 280 or something like that. But um, nine mana artifact when it enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices three creatures. And at the beginning of your upkeep, it steals a bunch of stuff from graveyards. I do like that it at least has that last ability to like actually put some forward momentum back into the game. But that initial ability of each opponent sacrifices three creatures, woof, that's a lot. And artifact decks are really, really good at re-triggering the abilities of artifacts that want to enter and leave and enter and leave and enter the leave. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a card that the times that I've seen it, it has been able to really control the board in a way that I have been a little bit like, eh, that's that, that kind of blows. So that's the one to me that I actually would have put higher than probably any of the other five. But again, that's that, that's just me. Oh, no, I, I had the same experience as you did, Joey. I Portal to Phyrexia, even playing in commander games, like, oh, that's that's very, very good. Each opponent sacrifices three creatures and, and it's nine mana. So you expect nine mana to be a very, very powerful card. But when you play against it, you see just how inevitable and just almost oppressive that pressure is that you get to just grab the best creature in any graveyard and put into play totally get it and then i played against the card on arena and i just wanted to quit that was the <laughs> most unfortunate thing ever uh, th this could go into my yannette deck because it's a nine mana card i no, do not put do it, it into my yannette deck because it produces a play pattern i don't want <laughs> don't so do yeah yeah that's my stake it, it turns out despite all our complaining over the years that we wish Grave Betrayal was better. We don't actually wish, wish Grave Betrayal was better because this is the, what you get when they give you a, an actual yeah. better version of Grave Betrayal. It's it's sort of like Switch from the Matrix. It's just not like this. Not like this. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, to be honest, Portal to Phyrexia kind of gives me God Pharaoh's statue vibes. I don't know if you guys get that one, uh, but that's the, the six mana legendary artifact that makes your opponent's spells cost two more to cast. And also at the beginning of your end speech opponent loses one life. And that one also is just like a just one of those cards where I look at it and just like, dang, that's actually a very good effect. I don't want it. I don't I don't want to do that one. Right. And I sort of yeah. get that vibes from Portal to Phyrexia too. I'm just like, am I too mean for doing this? If you're playing, it totally makes sense. Those can be very, very powerful cards. But they're, they're the kind of thing that I'm just like, oh, Assault Score seems deserving here because I would want to make sure my opponents have a heads up before I just slam one of these things into play. I want to make sure that they know that that's the type of stuff that we're all bringing to the table. Um, 
Another type of thing that I think is also fair to alert people about are some cards that actually got pretty low scores, but they have a high standard deviation within the data, which is to say that they were pretty divisive cards. And we've gone over this kind of thing in the past. It's a lot of the same characters that we've seen before. Basically, cards that have chaos effects... <laughs> Um, you know, for example, scramble verse and things like that. We once again see that a lot of people vote zeros on that and just as many people vote fours on that. So they average out to decently low scores, but it's not because a lot of people were voting two, two, two on those. Those are cards that people have very different types of reactions to. And that was just another thing for us to throw out here. There are some divisive cards out there, especially chaos, uh, chaos type of cards like Thieves Auction and, and those types of folks that are also important to note, even if they don't necessarily have the highest salt scores in the world, they do have some very different reactions to them. Well, in talking about cards like Thieves Auction that just take up a lot of game time, you have things like Space Bellerin from, from the Unfinity set. Um, you know, salt score of of 0.95 with a standard deviation of 1.55. That's a pretty big gap there. And again, that's a card that like you're just you are forcing people to take up time in a game in a way that maybe they didn't want to be doing. Well, and I I feel unless you're Mark Rosewater, everybody either loves them or hates unsets. I think all three of us are kind of in the mm, not for me camp, but the people that love these cards, they love them. And and I'm not surprised to see them so divisive in the salt scores because unsets are pretty divisive in the community in general, not just when it comes to how salty does this card make you feel in game? It's, well, I just don't, there, maybe you don't get the joke or maybe you don't enjoy the jokes. There's certainly that. And then the people that do, I mean, it's kind of like a separate fandom altogether almost. We looked at like the average salt score per set and Unfinity, the Commander Legal cards in Unfinity, they had the highest average salt score. Uh, it wasn't like a huge, enormous number, but like it, Wilds of Aldrain, for instance, had an average score of 0.25 and Unfinity had an average score of 0.4. And that's significant. That's higher than New Phyrexia, which has a bunch of Infect cards. In that. that one got a, a an average score of 0.34. So like Infect cards, and I just want to say that again, Infect cards, one of the most <laughs> famously like big things that people are uh, can get riled up about, had, had less of a, a salt inducement in this data than uh, Unfinity cards, like Costume Shop, Attractions, Stickers, and stuff like that. And I just think that's worth pointing out. I just think that's interesting data for us all to take away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the other thing I, I would say I, I would note about the Unfinity cards, again, this is, you know, a personal anecdote, personal experience. These kind of can sometimes get like surprised on you as well from out of nowhere where someone, you know, will maybe make a comment like, hey, well, I've got, you know, Uncard in here. Is that OK? And you're like, yeah, sure. And then, oh, you've got 28 Uncards in there. Not, <laughs> like I, I thought this was going to be a deck with, a, with with one thing that happened to fit your deck and okay, now we are, you know, we have to juggle every time we attack or your creatures deal no, no damage. Like I, this was not what I was sitting down to play tonight when I wanted to play some magic. So um, again, these are these, I absolutely get why sometimes these from multiple axes frustrate people and it, it generates some salt for sure. Yeah. And I can imagine it as well, these can be the types of cards that if they're not announced pregame, that can also be its own form of, uh, oh no, I didn't know we were playing that type of game as well. And that's, I think ultimately what this entire episode and it kind of comes back to, right? Of like, these are the types of cards that it's obviously perfectly fine to play, but it's probably just the type of thing that warrants a heads up for the play group to make sure that they can set their exp expectations properly and then engage with you in the the same way that you're hoping to play the game uh, you know salt having a high score having a low score it, it's all relative and it all comes down to what it is the experience that you're looking for and so once again we just hope that these are interesting tools that will help people find the types of games that they are looking for with other people uh, whether you want to have tons of salty slugs or whether you want to have a bunch of silly attractions it, it can all be a whole bunch of fun stuff and um Matt, I think that this means that we need to load a bunch of Unfinity cards into our decks when we play against I am Dan. not doing that. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> no, the thought either. behind that, but I am not doing that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely not doing it either. But I just uh, I, I went for a, a funny gag because uh, because y'all steal my segues and I got to get something in here. All right. I mean, yeah. not, not even you guys want to force Space Bell Run onto yourselves. Yeah, on the <laughs> yeah it, it, it's and, not and it's worth not, it. The trade off's not worth it. Yeah, it, it's not that we're forcing other people to deal with it. We're forcing ourselves to deal with it. And that's. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, the, the true salt is the one that's deep inside of ourselves for our own decks. Yeah, right, absolutely. exactly. All right. Well, listeners, we would love to hear what you think about all of this new salty data for this year. We hope you had a bunch of fun doing the salt voting polls the past week. And with that, I think we are going to call this episode to a close. So, fellas, if our listeners want to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find you on the onlines? Matt? 
So you can find me pretty much on any social media platform at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, we are streaming. We stream Wednesday evenings. We have guests on every single time, and it's always a good event. So make sure you tune in for that. And Dana. You can find me online at Dana Roach. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDHRECcast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me online at Joseph M. Schultz, most likely on places like Instagram. And you can find the cast at EDHRECcast on places on the onlines as well. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRECcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of this show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Wreck your deck.